thank you. Thank you. Thoroughly unprepared, we take the step into the afternoon of life. Worse still, we take this step with the false presupposition that our truths and our ideals will serve us as hitherto. But we cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be little at evening. And what in the morning was true, at evening will have become a lie. Can I get some uh, cream? Sure. Hmm. Sorry. Let me see it there. Thanks. Okay, we're all packed. I got the snacks. I got Jason's prescription. Boarded the dog. Car payment. Called the neighbors. Hey, Jack. Jack? Jack, I need you to turn off the video game and come downstairs and have breakfast. We're gonna leave in a little bit. Let me, let me just finish this level. Okay, fine, but then we're unplugged all weekend, got it? I don't even know what that means, unplugged. It's a very sad commentary on our life. Hey, sweetie. Time to get up, sweetheart. Hmm. Hmm. Is it tomorrow? It is tomorrow. It is, and we're gonna go on vacation, and we're gonna have so much fun, but we gotta miss the traffic, so let's get going. Gotta get up, <laughs> monkey. Okay, off you go. You're overreacting, Larry. I don't know what they can do. They can do a lot of damage to your image, Chad. Now listen, you have a brand to protect. More development can't afford lawsuits from environmental groups. This just isn't the right climate for that kind of stuff. What are you suggesting? I suggest you decide on some sort of compromise or we'll be tied up in court and you won't be able to start this project at all. You know, why didn't this come up when we did the impact report? I mean, for God's sake, we're talking about a tree. No, it's more than a tree. Chad, your pre-sales are already dropping, and now you're giving off the appearance of being insensitive. I am insensitive. It's a tree. You're paying me a lot of money for you advice that you're not Larry, we'll to. talk about this later. No, wait, you, wait a minute, you're, Chad. You're charging Chad, me by please, the minute. I'm on. hanging up now. No, don't act. What was that about? <sighs> I'm 80% done with this subdivision. Why don't you just not build near the tree? Then I lose money, and you don't get your bonus. I'm not reconfiguring an entire section of it because of a tree. Never mind, then. Have you made a decision about the board meeting this weekend in Monterey? Wait, what is this about? The House of Hope and Promise. Ugh, next time someone asks me to be on one of these boards, shoot me. 
You Johnson is on it, remember? I went to great lengths to get them to ask you to be on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Hugh Johnson's on the board, I'd better be on the board. In case you've forgotten, the House of Hope rehabilitates homeless families. I have put all of the information in this file for you. You can catch up on their mission in the car on the way there. I know what their mission is. It's to give handouts to people who can't handle things themselves. You know what? I never got a handout, and I managed okay. I will call your publicist and get them to say something about your philanthropic work. Hey, actually, that's a good idea. That'll deflect from the whole tree issue. I'm always thinking. Find where the director's cottage is. So. Hello? You gotta get a new van, bro. Yeah, what happened? Is it? Well, it's kind of hard to hear you. The, the reception's shoddy up here. What do you mean they're reconsidering? You're kidding, right? Well, you're my agent. You're too violent. What, the, what does that even mean? You, I don't make slasher films, I make art. You gotta convince them of that. You got. Do, do they even know the talent we have on this? Well, well, I, I, you gotta find a way to, to, to get them to, to... Look, he shook my hand, he looked me right in the eye, and he said, he said, this is a go project. I wanna do your film. Yes, because if the money doesn't come through, I'll have to scramble to get another investor. I thought this was a sure thing. Excuse me, coming through. You wanna make me happy? Get the money from my film. That would make me happy. I gotta go, I'm on the Wayne Dyer thing. Hey, bye. Wow, damn! Is there anything we could do? You got about five million? If I did, would I be here? Then I don't think you can help me. Cheer up, David. It's a quick job. It's quick, it's quick and fun. It's 6.30 in the morning, Sarah. Right. It's not gonna be fun. It's just a job. Nothing artsy, we'll get them their footage and then we're out of here. Wayne! Good morning, David. How, How are, are you? you? I'm great. How I hope this it? isn't too early for you. Oh, no, I've been up for hours. Good, yeah. good. This is Rob, our cameraman. We're very hey, lucky Rob. to have nice him. Nice to meet you. Ron does sound. Hey, Ron, nice to yeah. meet you, my and friend. And this is uh, Sarah, my Sarah. production coordinator. Hi, She's Pleasure. very resourceful. Great. If you need anything, just ask her. Got it. So if you're amenable, I thought we'd head down to the social hall right. area and then set up down there. Let's do it. I'm ready. I've been ready for hours. Yeah. yeah. Oh, let's do Grab it. Grab your cape. Let's go. Super. After Good. you, Johnson. All right. All right. How'd you sleep? I slept great. Oh, is there I'm anything? I'm excited about this. Uh, they, they, is there any expectation I should know about? I have no expectations. I'm totally in your hands. Whatever you want to do, I'm. Oh, I'm... I feel okay. sorry for you, Dr. Dyer. You're sorry you said that. I'm just going to blot you a little bit there. You got a little shine. OK. You can't go wrong at this place. Isn't that beautiful? It is gorgeous here. I'm sort of allergic to nature myself. Here. Oh, I just love it. I'm so thrilled to be here. He looks good. He went less trees, more trees. How's that look? Sure, that's fine. Do you know anything about the history of this place? Have you looked into it? Not really. We just go where they send us, you know? The guy who runs this is a fascinating guy. Uh, he was telling me about the history of it. You know, it's, I can't it's hear him. really a magical place. It's a, you know, it's Can you say that again? I'm sorry. It's a magical, magical place. I got him, I got him. Back in 1913, Julia Morgan, she was an architect, oh, right. and she designed this entire place. They set it up as a conference center for the Western Division of the YWCA, mm -hmm. and they would hold all of their meetings here. And the name of the place, it's called a Silomar. You know, who knows what a Silomar is? And I was asking him, he said, well, a, a Silo or a Cilio means a refuge, and Mar means a sea. It if, was... if we go, we can start. That's interesting. Hear that, David? I it heard together. it, yeah. This is a refuge by the sea, and it's just it's just stunning. It's just so beautiful. I'm so That's excited great. to be here. Wayne, just so you know, tomorrow and the next day, we'll just ask you uh, questions, and you go ahead and answer, and then we'll move locations and do more of the same. And I'll also be shooting some B-roll over the next couple of days. What do I get? B? B-roll? 
B roll, like uh, like walking like talks. You shooting exercise. the bees that are here. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's your vision. I'm 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 open to anything. I'm, whatever you see, I'm I'm happy to go along with it. Well, I'm more of a technician on this one. Really? Well, you know what? You might find yourself learning something. Maybe. Well, I'm open to it. Great. Uh, let's go ahead and roll camera. We're speeding. Sounds good. All right, Sarah, would you be kind enough to slate it? I would love to. You're going to slate me? I'm going to slate you. All right. Dr. Dyer, interview one. OK, Wayne, you came up here to, to write your latest book. Can you tell us a little bit about what you came up to write about? Yeah, I'd be happy to. One of the things that has intrigued me over the years is so many people coming up when I talk about purpose and finding, finding meaning in their life is, uh, what is my purpose? How do I find it? It always seems to be eluding me. I can't seem to get there. I've always felt that uh, the real purpose of life is, is just to be happy, to enjoy your life, to get to a place where you're not always trying to get someplace else. So many people spend their lives striving, trying to be someplace that they're not. They never get to arrive. One of the ways to understand about how to find your purpose in your life is to return to nature, to find your own nature. I wrote a book a few years back called Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, which was based upon the ancient teachings of Lao Tzu in a book called the Tao Te Ching. Lao Tzu reminds us that all being originates in non-being. Jesus put it this way in the New Testament, it's the spirit that gives life, that you didn't really come from your parents. You're, you really, all of us came from this place called spirit. And when you showed up here in this world, you showed up here from a tiny little drop of human protoplasm, a speck, if you will. And everything that was in that little speck that became you, everything that you needed was in that tiny little speck. One of the most important metaphors that I ever used is that the first nine months of your life, from the moment of your conception until the moment of your birth, Everything was being handled for you. There was nothing for you to do. You don't get consumed with the color your eyes are going to be or what your body is going to look like. It's all taken care of for you. You just surrender. I call it a future pull. And it's pulling. It's pulling you in the direction of whatever it is that you were supposed to be. And to me, it's not too great a stretch to say if everything you needed for the physical journey was already handled in there, then why not everything for the rest of the journey as well? All of your purpose, it's in there. All of what you, your personality, it's in there. Everything that you were to be, not just the physical you, but everything, if you just let go and allow. And so we're born. And we look at this beautiful little creature as parents. I have eight children. I've seen it happen many times. And you look at this beautiful little child and you look at it and you say, great work, God, great work. Couldn't be any better. We'll take over from here. <laughs> And then we're surrounded by all these people, our family, our culture, wherever we go. And we begin to be told that uh, we can't really trust in, in who we are. We have to trust in something outside of ourselves. So we're on a journey towards ambition. Once you begin to say, we'll take over from here, you introduce something, you just take this perfection and you just edge out the creator. You edge God out. E G O, ego. This ego is the part of us that starts to tell us who you are is not this perfect divine creation, this piece of God that you came from. It doesn't say that. It says who you are is what you have. It begins with things like our toys, and then our bank accounts, and then the possessions that we have. Before you know it, we begin to identify ourselves on the basis of our possessions. We begin to take on a set of beliefs about the more that I have, the more valuable I am as a person. And so we spend our lives taking these young children and immersing them in a culture that emphasizes more. It becomes almost a mantra of the ego. You have to have more. And the more you have, the more you are aware of how much other people are trying to take it away from you. The more you get consumed with how do I protect it and how do I make more of what I have? The dilemma here is that if you are what you have and things go away, then who you are also goes away in the process. Going somewhere? Yeah, I thought I'd come with you. Why? Why not? Because this is a work thing. I'll be in meetings all day tomorrow. I'll have nothing to do. 
Doesn't matter if you're busy. I'll go shopping or something. I'll be fine. Hi. Sorry, we won't be needing you after all. Thanks, you can go. What are you doing? Oh, come on, it'll be a beautiful drive. Which car should we take? You are not coming, and I do not want to drive. I want to be driven because I have work to do. Okay, well, then I'll drive. Let's take the Porsche. Denise, the place I'm going, it's not the kind of place you're used to. It's rustic. I think I can handle it, Chad. I know how to rough it. You know, I don't understand the sudden desire to spend time together. I just want to get away. Would you prefer I got my own room? Okay, what's wrong with you? Maybe I'm interrupting something. Oh, come on. Are you meeting someone else? Of course not. Look, I don't even want to go to this thing. Well, then all the more reason I should go with you. You're not going to fit all those bags in the Porsche. <sighs> Why don't you help me try? The second aspect of the ego is this idea that I am not only what I have, but I am what I do as well. We are. are you going to get that? No, no, please. Go ahead. That's oh, all right. No well, we're stopped here. Do you want anything, Dr. Dow? You want water or anything? No, no, I'm fine. We're still rolling, guys. We're cutting. What? Oh, keep rolling. Keep rolling. Please. So, second component of this ego is the idea that not only is who I am what I have, but it's what I do. And what I do becomes this thing called achievement. And in this whole world of believing that I am what I do, we become consumed with this whole idea of my success, my value, my worth as a human being is based upon how much I accomplish. So I have to make more money. I have to get a promotion. I have to compete with everybody else who's trying to get what I have. We are taught this over and over and over again. All of our young people are taught this when they go out into athletics. The most important thing you can do is be number one. And you say, we're number one. We're better than everybody else. And we constantly find ourselves in this competitive notion again of, of believing that our world is one in which we have to compete. That's what the ego says. Now, the third aspect of this is the idea that I am what other people think of me. That is, I am my reputation. Particularly, this is relevant for young people who are taught that you have to dress the way other people think. And if other people don't like you, then there's something wrong with you. If you're consumed with that, then you're going to be something different every time you turn around. Now, this is particularly relevant with women, and especially in relationship to the family. Women are often taught in our culture and our society that the only way that you can fulfill yourself is by how you relate to your family, to yourself as a daughter, to yourself as a mother, to yourself as a grandmother. And while these are very important and creative aspects of every woman's life, if, if that's the choice that they make, it's not necessarily the only thing. And many women feel that deep within them that they have a calling to accomplish something great, to make a contribution. And oftentimes we'll put it aside. So what I encourage women to think is don't ignore that calling inside of you. Don't ignore the part of you that says you came here to create something powerful and you have just as much of an influence in doing that, just as much of a right to do that as anyone else does. Sure, I saw that one too. I wonder if I can get the whole collection on DVD? I think that might be a possibility. Do you know what my favorite episode is? I don't. Kick the can. Now that is a good one. You know, when all the old people become young again. Yes, yes, heartbreaking, isn't it? You know, I, 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 the other episode I like is the one right. where... You know what, I'd like the... to uh, check in. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. I, are, you, are you with the wedding? Uh, no. <laughs> There's a wedding? People actually get married here? Yeah, all the time. I'm not criticizing it. I think it's charming. <laughs> Chad Moore. More development? Yes. Ethan Lipton. I used to work for your company a few oh, years ago. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, in accounting. Yeah, sure. Darling, we'll talk later, OK? OK, great. Oh, be great. sure to tell the guys to show up on time tomorrow night at the rehearsal dinner. This whole weekend is going to be a continuous celebration of love. Well, I do like love. <laughs> well, that's why I'm in this business. <laughs> Bye. Are you getting married? Ah, uh, no, I'm with the band. Oh, well, have a fun weekend of love. <laughs> you guys, too. Do you remember that guy? Not at all. Hi there. Hey, let's see, I'm checking in. Uh, the house of something? 
Promise and hope. Ah, uh, promise it. Chad Moore, I'm on the board. Welcome to Asylum Moore, Mr. Moore. We have you in North of Longviews. If you go out the door yeah. and to your left... My wife has joined me unexpectedly, so could we get one of the larger you rooms? You don't have to tell him that. Well, they weren't expecting you. You were it's unexpected. one of the nicer rooms would be wonderful. Thank you. I'm not used to camping. <laughs> camping. That's funny to me. Let me see what I can do for you. There's so much stuff we can do. Oh, that'd be cool. Where, where are that. the kids? Huh? Oh. Oh. Uh, Ethan. Ow, whoa. Jack, Jack, Ethan, Jack, come Jack. over here. Yeah. Come on. Hey, come on. Get over here. Come here, troopers. All right. Take you and go with your mom. <laughs> Stay on my toes. Yeah, and uh, also something away from all the noise would be nice. I do have a room on the first floor in the lodge building. Yeah, no, uh, uh, something higher. higher. Of course, Mr. Moore. You do have a room on the second floor. Higher than that, please. I'm afraid that's about as high as we go here. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> what a waste of real estate. I think you'll like this room. It has a balcony. All right, if you say so. Give me a second. Give that to your mother. Give that to your mother. You heard her. Hand it over. I said we were going to be unplugged this whole weekend. <laughs> Did you guys just want to go home? <laughs> no, we're not going to go home. It's no fun. Come here, let's stand with me. Here, jump on my feet. Jump on my okay. feet. I'll lift you. Ah. There's no way we can have all these meetings with these kids running around and screaming. Have a great stay. Look, I don't need to be having this conversation right now. I don't have time for this. I can't deal with this right now. I, it's not... We move into then the later parts of, of the ego, which talks about something called separation. And the ego has a very strong belief system that who I am is separate from everybody else. And then another component of the ego teaches us that I'm also separate from everything that's missing in my life, from all the things that I'd like to have. And then finally, the ego teaches us the most egregious error of all. It teaches us that we are separate from God. And one of the simple constructs that you learn in the afternoon of your life when you shift into the meaning phase of your life is to realize that you came from a source. We can call it God, we can call it Tao, it doesn't matter what we call it. And that this source is everywhere. There's no place that it is not. It must be because it creates everything. Everything comes from this source. Then it must be in me. If there's no place that it's not, it must be in me. And if it must be in me, it must also be in whatever it is that I feel to be missing from my life. If you know that, then in some way, everything that's missing from your life that you would like to have, you're already connected to it in spirit. And all you have to do is figure out a way to align yourself with that and have a knowing that you're already connected to it. You just have to bring it on its way in the that's way that intense. you think and process. What was that out loud? Yeah, you just said that out loud. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. It's it is going. intense. Okay. <laughs> There's no question about it. It's okay. very intense. Please continue. Okay. I was saying that as we move into the afternoon of our life, we take the same ego constructs that we learned in the morning of our life, which is all about competition, winning, being better than everybody else, and we try to apply these same constructs to the afternoon of our life. And what happens is we end up living a lie for what was true in the morning, in the evening, has become a lie. The problem is we don't really know how to move into the meaning phase of our life. This is when we have to learn to go back to those first nine months from the moment of our conception until the moment of our birth. Lao Tzu speaks about this in the Tao Te Ching. Let yourself be lived by it. He says that the Tao does nothing. It's leaving nothing undone. This is where we have to get to a place where we can surrender and have a knowing that we're not alone and that we're going to be guided and that we have a nature and that we can trust in this nature. It's not something that we have to always be struggling with. It's not something we have to be in charge of. Literally, think about it. Let yourself be lived by it rather than you taking over. But as we move into the meaning phase of our life, what's happening is we begin to think about fulfilling a dharma, fulfilling a destiny, fulfilling something inside of us, a calling that only we can feel inside of us. No one else can tell you what that is, but if you feel it and you know it, winning and being ahead of other people takes a back seat to feeling fulfilled and living your life on purpose. Hey. Oh. 
get anything to drink? Juice box? Sure. I'm gonna go back and get some more sunscreen. Really? We got clouds. No, they can still get burned. Okay. You gonna walk back? Yeah, I'll be fast. Well, we can wrap it up here. No, no, look at them. They're having so much fun. I don't wanna drag them away. I'll be right back. Okay. You got some great stuff. Well, I think it was a good start. I think it really was. I think uh, I think you're gonna see this thing come together in some unexpected ways. You're gonna be surprised. You really are. Directors don't like surprises. Uh, well, you're in for some. <laughs> great. I'll see you in the morning. I look forward to it. Thanks for everything. It was great. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. Did Thanks for everything. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You see you later. Drive. Yep. Okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Looks like they're reaching for each other. Sorry? Well, the, the trees, it looks just like they're reaching for each other. Yeah, you're right, it does. A whole place. It's like a different painting every day. You know, you're very fortunate to work here. <laughs> I know. Hey. You want a lollipop? Excuse me? It's root beer. <laughs> you like root beer? Actually, I do. It's root beer, but with a little bit of liquid. Thank you. Hmm. I like it. I like everything about this place. Like what? What do you like about it? I don't know. Uh... It's just, it's, it's so beautiful. I, I, don't, I, I can't describe it. In words, yeah. I guess so. I mean, it, 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 words versus images. Images? Pictures. No, don't do that either. I used to, when I was in college. I used to drive down to the beach and I'd, I'd sketch for hours. Oh well, doesn't matter anyway. Oh well. Hey mom, where you been? What? We got cold. You eating a lollipop? I am. You any candy for the kids? Don't no, worry. I'm sorry. I. Oh. oh that's all right. Well, let's go back. Come on, buddy. Let's go. Yeah. All oh. right. It's okay. Here. Oh, oh, I, I don't get it, to be honest with you. That really doesn't surprise any of us, David. Seriously, if I didn't have ambition, nothing we got done. Um, is that supposed to be a comment about us? You have a napkin, please. You know what I mean. Like, we're supposed to sit around and, and wait for things to happen to us magically? There's nothing wrong with a little magic in life. I can't trust magic. What I can trust is my own will to get things done. That's my main problem with what Dr. Dyer's saying. OK, he's right there. You want to keep it down? He didn't hear me. Dr. Dyer? You want to oh, come join hi. us? Sure, I'd love to. How are you guys doing? Great. Good. This chicken's great. Mm, good, good. So, Dr. Dyer. Yes. Um, we were all just discussing in right. your first interview and mm -hmm. all those things you said. And basically, David thinks that it's all BS. What? Mm -hmm. David? I, I, yes, I, I, really? I, I, I don't think mm -hmm. all of it is. I mean, we're, I'm, in, I'm entitled to my own opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You are entitled to your opinion, and I respect it. And you know, David, you don't have to get this all at once. You know, just get a little bit at a time. That's that's all it takes. You know, you just start practicing it. Eventually, it becomes a way of life, and you start living from a different perspective. I'm not really a spiritual person. I'm too busy. Yeah, spirituality is kind of like a luxury. Mm. That is true. I find it hard to find time to meditate. Let me ask you this. Do you think that you're uh, an inspired person? Do you live an inspired life? Do you feel inspired? 
Um, I, I have no idea. Really? Well, let's, let's take an example. Let's supposing I had a, an apple pie that we had just made. And out of this apple pie, we take one slice. We take this, we take the rest of the pie, put it over here, and I take this slice and I give it to someone. Let's say I gave it to you, Ron, and I say, Ron, what is this? Um, that's an ap apple pie. How do you know that? How do you know it's an apple pie? Because it came from an apple pie. So, <laughs> well, you laugh, but I mean, the truth is that's a very profound statement that you just made, that everything in the universe must be <laughs> like what it came from. You take an acorn and you'll never get a rose bush out of it. You look at yourself and you ask yourself the question, where did I come from? Who am I and what am I like? You know, instead of making our choices out of the place that we really are, our authentic self, we're making them out of the ego. And every time we make choices out of the ego, all kinds of things begin to happen to us that take us away from finding meaning so in our lives. So how do you know if you're making a choice from your, your higher self? You gauge everything on the basis of how you feel. Are you stressed out? Are you anxious? Are you fearful? Are you angry? Do you feel good about yourself? Do you feel like you're on purpose? Do you feel like your life has any meaning? When you're operating out of the only part of yourself that is authentic, bliss is your response. But what about the upside of ambition? I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, and, and if, if I didn't... Doesn't ego serve me? I mean, if I was going with the flow, I had to, I'd never get a movie made. That's a conclusion that you've come to because you think out of the ego. You know, the fact is that uh, you might even be able to make much greater films if you came out of a, of, a, of a higher place. Imagine yourself as being able to live and work and do everything that you do from this place that, well, it's called Dharma. What's Dharma? Dharma is a spiritual principle that implies there is a purpose to our lives. Like an otter has a dharma, a bird has a dharma. Everything has a purpose. And when you find yourself living from that purpose, you're, you, you have found your dharma. Your dharma is something that you're, you, know, you, you will be living by. And rather than constantly using the ego, you will begin to say, this is what I'm here for. It's like, I call it a calling. It's like an inner calling. How do you know what your uh, dharma is? Like, what if you... Can't even find your dharma. Yeah, I can't even find a date, let alone my dharma. Well, your, your, your dharma isn't anything you're ever going to find. Your dharma is something that you're always connected to. It is, uh, it is your divine purpose. It is something that you Hello. are uh, aligned with throughout your entire Hello. life. The ego has kept us excuse, away from excuse it. Excuse me, That's I have to difficulty. take this. This is what I'm well, talking okay. about. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. How does this help me find a date exactly? You don't need to find a date. If you live what I'm talking about, you'll understand that everything will be perfect and everyone that comes into your life will come in on time perfectly. You're a divine creation of God. You're a spiritual being. You don't need anyone else to confirm that. I love that. <laughs> it's true. Ooh, Dr. Dyer girl. said it was. It is true. <laughs> You know, I, I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate what you're saying. I do. Oh. I, I, not that you would necessarily be concerned with what I'm saying, because that's the ego telling you what to think, right? So you, so you were listening? Yeah, I'm listening. I just think it's good to have a plan. Well, what's your plan? To be a successful filmmaker, to make a name for myself, to make money, to have a good relationship. So you're talking here about prosperity, you're talking about abundance, you're talking about happiness. I haven't have any problem with that. I've, I've been attracting abundance and prosperity into my life forever. I think it's, I think it's actually quite, quite easy to do. I really believe in it. For you? Well, you know, the, the problem, what you're talking about here is the ego. The ego and, the, and, and your attachments. You know, you become attached to, uh, you know, how much money you're making and uh, how well your film is doing and uh, is, is everything working the way, I, you know, I've been told that it should work. Uh, when you become attached to things and they go away, you then lose who you are. But it feels so much like survival. We're not talking about survival here. We're talking about a shift, a shift away from the, the morning of your life and, and having to do everything for uh, external reasons and moving into a, into a higher place in your life. Why don't we start with that tomorrow, how to make this shift? It's a good idea. You know, I tell my audiences all the time that uh, if this is something new to you and you've never heard it before, 
There's a shift probably heading your way as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's all I need. Well, it could happen. Great thinkers talk about union with God. There's this theme that comes through. It's about being in silence. When everyone else is asleep and there are no distractions, when you feel yourself alone with Source, this is the time when you are closest to Source. Being alone with Source is not just about feeling good, it's about a new awareness of my own divinity and what it's capable of achieving. It's all about returning back to the place that you came from. T.S. Eliot has a great quote, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. I got a cut. Wayne, hold there for a minute. Hold there, Wayne, for a second. What is it? It's a bad angle. I got to be lower. How long? Five minutes. Wayne, take five. Just hang there. We're readjusting the shot. Absolutely. No problem. You want some water, Dr. Dyer? No, thanks. I have an ocean here. Finish that test real quick. All right, all right, sir. Hi, you've reached the office of Alex Chase at ICM. Please leave a message for Alex or Jason at the tone. Thanks. Alex, it's David. Call me back when you get this. I'm, I'm getting a little antsy. I, I think we should have heard by now. What did the executive say? That, do you know anything? And and why haven't I had a meeting yet? See the difference? Yeah. <laughs> Call me back and appreciate it. Ooh. Wayne Dyer interviews day two. Roll it. Okay, we'll start with the transition from ambition to meeting. Great, it's a good idea. I can give you an example from my own life. It might be helpful. I, when I first started writing, I was very blessed to be uh, considered quote successful. My motivation very often became um, how much money was I going to make on this book? What was my next contract going to look like? Um, how many weeks did it appear on the New York Times bestseller list? What position was it? Um, did you get on The Tonight Show? Did you get on The Donahue Show? Hold on, I'm or... confused. Yeah? Yeah, if you were success, who cares what was motivating you? Well, I guess you begin to change your definition of uh, what it is that constitutes success. I mean, success... Uh, can be identified in those terms, and uh, and there are other ways to look at it as well. But there's people listening to you. I mean, where would you be if you didn't initiate it? I mean, it got you started, right? I'm sorry to interrupt. Are we switching to a Q&A format? I, I'm just, I'm just curious. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's a very normal question. It's, a, it's a very common concern that people have. For myself, we talked about my writing, David. And yes, by all means, it was successful. But there was a part of me inside of me that said. There's, uh, there's something more for me. I was writing books about psychology. Your, your erroneous sounds, pulling your own strings, the sky's the limit. All of them were doing well. All of them were bestsellers. It was all. But inside of me, I was shifting. There was a calling to something else, and I could see the shift taking place in my life. And the shift was, um, it was more in the direction of spirituality. It was more in the direction of higher consciousness. I began to become excited and, and, uh, and thrilled by, by reading people like Krishnamurti, by reading people like Muktananda. And I remember going to my agent and I said, I want to write a book about how to take some of these great spiritual ideas. He said, no, 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 no. You're going to write a book about sex. He said, this is going to sell. This is like uh, Dr. Ruth has got one, but you're way better than Dr. Ruth. You know, and he's going on and on. And, I, and he said, and then I've got a second book for you. and We're going to do a two book deal. And you're going to write a book about how to make money. You know, Wayne Dyer's approach to making money. And I'd say, Artie, I said, I, that, that's, I can't do that. I said, I, I have to write about it. He said, no, nobody's going to buy this stuff. He said, this is just, he said, that's just for, that's the airy-fairy stuff. That's out there. That's all that new agey stuff. He said, you don't want to, I said, but I have to write that. That's what I'm living. That's what I'm feeling. It's so exciting. And I remember submitting the proposal to him and uh, he said, all right, I'll send it in. And they reluctantly, they didn't give me much of an advance at all because they didn't even believe in it. But off I went. 
There was a strong inner kind of feeling that I had something greater to give. I had something that I had to do that was beyond just going through the motions, just doing what I had already mastered, what I knew how to do. I remember when I made the shift, even though there was a little bit of fear, I remember feeling probably the freest that I'd, that I'd felt ever in my life. I wasn't motivated by whether people are going to buy it, how much money I'm going to make, whether people are going to put me on a bestseller list. Those became external kind of factors. Those became things that started to chase me rather than me chasing it. Basically, I think, David, what I'm trying to say to you is that, that you get to a place in your life where you start to be guided by something that's larger than yourself. Just stay aligned with what you're here for and stay in harmony with spirit, with God, with source. Stay there. And as you stay there, Hello, the meaning phase of your life yeah. begins to take over. And once you cross over into the afternoon of your life, it's impossible to go back. Wait, wait. Monday, you can't keep telling me Monday. If it was coming through, you would come through like, like five Mondays ago. Well, we can take a pause no, here for a second. You are Let's not see. telling me this right now. What do you mean? They're replacing me? You don't know what to tell me? This movie meant everything to me. This, I, I bought them this movie! It's my movie! This movie meant everything to me! Damn it. Okay, this would be a great place to break. Is right. he okay, you think? Is he? I think he's gonna be fine. Let's just call it lunch. Okay. Everybody get something to eat, right. okay? And then, um, as soon as I... Lunch is one half hour. If anybody is interested in the Ryan County project, TV. Hey, you up for a late game of golf? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I'll reserve it. Thanks. You know how long this meeting's gonna last after lunch? I don't really know. I think they're saving some of the big items until the end. Like what? Well, they're a million down in the San Francisco project. The contractor underbid, now they're over budget. Oh, you know what, listen, you can catch me up on all that stuff this afternoon when we play golf. You're not coming back? Oh, no, I am. I'm gonna try. I just uh, got a lot of work to do. See you later. Okay. Good book? Not bad. I'm sort of a slow reader, but it's being patient with me. <laughs> you said you worked for my husband? A long time ago. I don't think he remembers me. Oh, I think he remembers you. Well, he let a bunch of us go all at once, because, you know, he needed to scale back. Sorry about that. Hey, it's OK, truly. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. I needed to try some different things, pursue some other avenues. Like your music. Like my music? Yeah. Well, it sounds like your story has a happy ending. Not yet, I hope. Uh, no. Don't rush me now. No, that's not what I meant. I meant you uh, seem happy. Mom. Hey, you know what? You and Chad ought to come to this party that we're playing at tonight. Oh, thanks anyway. Yeah, come on. It's supposed to be a continuous celebration of love. Isn't that what she called it? Oh, yes, I, I think she did. Okay, so you guys have to be there to help us continuously oh, celebrate. I can't crush a party. I just invited you. You can't invite us. Too late. Sorry. Happened. <laughs> uh, no. Thanks, though. Um, I'll see you around. OK. Wear something comfortable. Denise. Denise. Hey, slow down. Stop. Oh, hi. Why didn't you stop? I didn't see you there. Where are you going? Uh, I was going into town. I thought you were in meetings all day. I was. But, uh, I'm bored. Yeah, well, if Hugh Johnson can do it, you can do it. I'm not cut out for this nonprofit things. So. Oh, Chad, you just gotta fake it. No, I'm coming with you. What? I said I'm coming into town with you. Honey, I love you, but I don't enjoy shopping with you. I need some me time. I thought we were supposed to spend time together. 
right? Look, Denise, I'm not kidding. I cannot take another meeting. I'm coming with you. Whatever. Hey, guys, stop it. Take it over there or you're going to lose the water guns. Oh, oh they got you all wet. Oh, it's no big deal. It's just water. Water is soft. Don't, don't, don't give it another thought. It's great. I am so sorry. Don't be sorry. I've got eight kids of my own. I've got grandchildren. Um, you know, these things happen. Uh, things get messy once in a while. It's fun. <laughs> oh, thank you. That makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> I always see it as an opportunity to sort of practice what I call non-interference. Oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, you can. Of course you can. Really? I mean, I'm their mother. Isn't that a little irresponsible? I don't see it as irresponsible at all. I think parenting is not about uh, having children lean on you. It's about making leaning unnecessary. Yeah, they've got a compass. Let them follow their own compass. Hmm. What would I do with myself if I wasn't interfering? Oh, I don't know. Do you ever think about music or art or something like that? How'd you know? Know what? Nothing. <sighs> Thank you. It was re really, really nice talking to you. Oh, you too. God bless you. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. All right, guys, come on. Time for lunch. I don't want to yeah. eat. Me either. Yeah, before the ants eat us. Uh. I'll return that dress. The one you just bought? The red one. I waited 45 minutes for you to decide if you were going to buy that. I don't think I like it. Then why'd you buy it? Actually, I, I think I already have it. It took you an hour to buy a dress that you already have. This is exactly why you shouldn't come shopping with me. Well, I've got an idea. How about if we just not talk to each other at all? Jesus, Chad. I, sh I really should have come alone. I've got a lot on my mind. You've got a lot on your mind. What could you possibly have on your mind? All right. I wasn't going to tell you this until tonight, but... What? This weekend is a, a write-off for you, right? Because you're on the board of that charity. Right. You're about to have another write-off. What's that supposed to mean? Ugh, God, I'm trying to put this in a way you can relate to. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not relating. I'm pregnant. What? You're joking. No, I'm not joking. I don't want kids. I know, I know. I didn't either, but this just happened and I thought, I don't know, maybe it's time for change, you know, that we should experience this thing that everyone says is so wonderful. You know, maybe, maybe it's time to stop being so selfish and start thinking about I something other than... I want to be than... selfish. I like being selfish. I like our lives. We come and go when we want. We're happy. Oh, you think we're happy, Chad? I, I, I don't know if we're happy. I mean... God, you're, you're always at work. We're, we're, we never see I'm each other anymore. I'm always at work because I need to buy you the things that you want, Denise. Cars, clothes, houses, everything you want. But still, it's not enough to make you happy. Please, keep it down. 
I want this baby. I think it could be the most wonderful thing we could do with our lives. Come on, I get what this is about. This is about you feeling like you haven't done anything in your life. So you think you need a baby to feel validated. Well, you know what? I don't. I worked my way up from nothing and I will not sacrifice our lifestyle so that you can indulge in yet another distraction. Wow. A baby is not a pair of shoes, Denise. I know that, Chad. You are so cruel and you're so mean. God, you, you used to be fun. I, what is it, what has happened? You planned this, didn't you? It was an accident. Sir, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Please. It can happen. How could you do this? How could you do no, this? Thank you so much. Thank you for making this the, the tender, precious moment that every tender, woman Tender, precious about. moment? We don't have tender, precious moments. No, you know don't. what we did have? We had a prenup, an agreement. You signed it, no kids. I know, and I changed my mind, okay? People can change. Well, you know what? I didn't change my mind. Well, what are you gonna do about it? Divorce me because I'm pregnant? I might. As a matter of fact, I'm definitely divorcing you. Will you please shut up? I okay, definitely fine. I don't care. Go ahead. I'm better off raising this baby without you. Good luck. You signed that prenup. You nice. won't get much. I'll make sure of it. I hate you! you. <laughs> Sir. I'm fine! I still need I'm you. I'm fine! Sir, I am still gonna have to ask you to leave. Oh, I'm leaving. Don't worry about paying. Oh, I am definitely paying for this meal. Please, sir, it's not necessary. Oh, she, she's got my wallet. Hey! You took my wallet, you kleptomaniac! You left her in the room, you moron! I'm calling my lawyer. I'm calling my lawyer right oh, now. Oh, really? How are you gonna do that without your precious phone? Hey, come back here! Come back! Stay with the same frame size, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, guys. Ready. Okay. Rising. Okay, Wayne, can you just shift your chair just a tiny Sure. Thank you. Oh, perfect. 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 Okay. okay, so we good? We are good. All right. David. We're rolling. David? Uh, David, why don't why don't we take it from where Wayne was talking about the shift? We can, can just continue from there. Sounds good to me. Okay, this, this shift, this movement from ambition to meaning, from the morning to the afternoon of your life, generally it's preceded by what we call a quantum moment. Sounds strange perhaps to use a term like that, but quantum moment really refers to uh, the, the characteristics of uh, what it is like when you have what Maslow called a peak experience. Uh, the first of these qualities, there's four of them. The first of them is, uh, is that it's very vivid. The second quality or characteristic of these quantum moments is that uh, it's a surprise. And the third characteristic of these quantum moments is that they are benevolent. They always feel good. The fourth and final quality is that it's enduring. That is, it isn't just something that comes and then goes and it's out the window. It lasts with you forever. For example, uh, I left drinking behind in my life uh, 21 years ago, and I couldn't even imagine that I could have given it up because I'd always had two or three beers every single day for the previous uh, 10, 15, 20 years. I couldn't even remember a day when I hadn't. And uh, I knew that I had to make that, that change. And it was 4.05 a.m. in the morning. I could remember the clock when it, when it turned. I woke up, and there was like... It was like a breeze in the room, something that I'd, I'd never experienced before. The smell of roses. This was 21 years ago now. I can tell you what was, uh, what was hanging on the closet, the hook that I had there. On the mirror there, I had a little a cartoon that I had there. I can still see that thing exactly as if, it, as if it happened this morning. The vividness of this is something that I've never, ever been able to forget. I can remember how surprised I was at what was happening at that time. It was almost as if... Um, some kind of force had, had taken over, and I just, I was just amazed by it. So if you're lucky this happens to you, 
Uh, David, it has nothing to do with luck. It's like when the moment is right, when you are in a different state, in a different place in your life, uh, exactly what is supposed to happen will happen for you. The low points in your own life, these times when you think that nothing could go any worse, oftentimes are the things that we need to propel ourselves to a higher place. Let me give you an example. The night before that moment that I just described to you, I had taken my entire family, five children, and my wife, and we had all gone to this restaurant. And like I always did, every single time I went to a restaurant, I ordered not just one beer, but two. And that was so that uh, in case the waiter wasn't there when I wanted my second one, I would be able to have it. And the waiter said to me, oh, excuse me, sir. He said, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I can't serve you alcohol. And I said, why? He said, well, uh, last night one of our waiters served someone who was underage and we had our license suspended. I said, come on, we're getting out of here. And I made each one of my children get up, get back into the car, strapped into their car seats and so on. My wife, who God knows had so much to do and it was su such a hardship for her, but it didn't seem to matter to me at that time because I wanted to have my beers and I was making myself more important than everyone else. And we drove off and went to another restaurant. And I can remember thinking that night as I went to sleep how, how ashamed I was. My wife tried to talk to me a little bit about it, but I would have none of it. I was right, and that's just what the ego always makes you. It makes you right. <clears throat> and that night, that experience that I had at 4.05 a.m. the next day, not only did it get me off of alcohol, it probably saved my life. It, it transformed my life in so many different ways. And it was all because I was open to it, you don't believe that. It sounds like more sitting around until some sort of epiphany comes to you. Mm. It's not about waiting around. You know, in the Tao, one of the great lessons that I learned is that it teaches us how to be soft, how to be flexible, how to not be always in control. One of the great teachings of the Tao says that uh, let yourself be lived by it. But you didn't do anything. That's the whole point. That's the place you want to get to where you just allow. In the recovery movement, it's called letting go and letting God. Allowing this source that is always flowing through each and every one of us to do and perform its magic. And that magic will always work in our best interest if we just surrender to it. If you could just stop interfering in your own life and just let yourself be done. If you can get to that place, nothing will be left undone. Everything that you need will be there for you. It's mysterious for most of us because we believe that we're the ones who have to do everything. Isn't it interesting that you had everything you needed in the first nine months? Why isn't that true for the next 90 years? Because we interfere. When I was 19 years old, I was uh, in the United States Navy and as an, an enlisted man. And I was given my assignment to uh, join the uh, aircraft carrier, the USS Ranger. And uh, it was on deployment in uh, Yokosuka, Japan. So I boarded a refrigerator ship, the USS Vega, in Alameda, California. And just as I was getting on that ship to take my 29-day voyage across the Pacific Ocean, my Uncle Bill, Bill Volick, who was a uh, school teacher in Hayward, California, handed me a copy of a book. And the book was a collection of short stories written by Leo Tolstoy. He wrote not just great novels and great stories, but uh, great spiritual literature as well. He was considered to be the soul of Russia. And, uh, the first story in this collection was called The Death of Ivan Illich. Now, Ivan Illich was a judge who lived in uh, Moscow. One of the more important features of this story is his relationship to his wife, who he basically hated because he despised his work. And he felt that uh, she had pressured him and pushed him into doing this, that it was a prestigious thing to do. And he was filled with internal rage and anger at what he had done. The title of the story kind of gives it away, The Death of Ivan Illich. You know he's going to die. Now, Ivan Illich was lying on his deathbed, and his wife is holding his hand, this woman that basically he despised for all of his life. And he looks up into her eyes, and his last words are, what if my whole life has been wrong? 
and he died. I was very shaken and very moved by that. And I took out a pad of paper and I wrote a note to myself. And I said, Dear Wayne, don't die with your music still in you. And I've lived that for my entire life. When you die, you will return to that source and you will be in that space of love. But the Tao says that you don't have to die to get there. You can die to the ego and live from that space of perfect love while you're here. That vivid, surprising, benevolent, enduring quality that defines the quantum moment that leads us into the shift is really an indication that you're returning back to the source. You're beginning to live from the Tao. It's reconnecting with the field of intention. In Greek, the word enthusiasm breaks down to entheos yasm, which means the God within. When you have passion, when you have enthusiasm for something inside of you, that's really God speaking to you and saying to you, don't get to the end of your life and have to be able to say what Ivan Illich said, what if my whole life has been wrong? I can't think of a greater tragedy than that. Hey, Mom! <laughs> what? What is it? Earth to Mom, where'd you go? I'm sorry, it's just... It's so beautiful. I was imagining how I'd paint these trees. You don't put paint on trees! <laughs> oh, no, honey, it's, um, like make a painting of it. You know, like you make a picture in school? Mom, you're not a painter. I didn't paint anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh. Next one to that rock up there. Wait, go! Go! Let's go get him. Let's go get him. <laughs> Money. God bless you. What? I said, God bless you. Why would you say that? I didn't even give you any money. You got any money? Not at the moment. But you? I need to call a cab. Hey, here you go. 
This should help you. Thanks. Wouldn't happen to have a cell phone in there, would you? I don't need one. You make money with that stuff? I make good money. Where do you live? Over there. Over there. But my favorite place is there. Under that tree, that's my favorite. I know that tree. We are friends. It's a good one, huh? You know what you gotta do? You get some of these bottles. And you can make some money. There's a machine down there. And you put the bottles in and you make some money. Thanks. Maybe I can save up for a cell phone. <laughs> 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 Some money. <laughs> I do. I have six pennies. God bless you. Synchronicities. It's like a collaboration with fate. All of that becomes the norm, and the ego is no longer the driving force in your life. You begin to recognize that there's a powerful organizing intelligence that's in all things, and it's working with you and for you, almost as if you're making it happen by just being connected to your source. The destiny that appeared to be imposed upon you by something outside of yourself is no longer the relevant driving force in your life. You're connected to the source, and it's almost as if this divine organizing intelligence, God, the Tao, whatever you want to call it, it's almost as if it's saying to you, you play the music that you came here to play, and I'll be there to help you overcome any struggle or any obstacle that comes along. And it's not going to be a struggle because source is supporting you. Yes, hi. Um, could I get a cab, please, to uh, Monterey Motors? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. I can't stop thinking about what you said about a destiny being imposed upon you. Well, you know, I, I think all of us, each and every one of us, have a, a knowing within us. You know, it's been said that when you trust in yourself, you're trusting in the very wisdom that created you. It's there, it's there to tell us who we are and what we're meant to be. I know, but so much of society is putting stuff on people, it seems no, like all I'm, the time. I'm good. Dr. Doug, can I ask you a question? Sure. Are men and women different when it comes to this? Do they shift differently? It's very different, as a matter of fact. There's some recent studies that have just been published on that. I'd, I'd be happy to share them with you if you like. That would be great. OK, super. All right, I'm taking off. OK, man, I'll catch up with you. So there was this incredible study done. It's, uh, I've got it right here. It's called The Moment That Turns Your Values Upside Down. And there's four components to it. There's men and women before and after. Now, before one of these quantum moments, they were asked just to list uh, the most important priorities of their life, from the most important to the least important. Now, for men, the very first and most important value that they had learned was wealth, the accumulation of money. It's not really that big a surprise, yeah. because we are taught as men when we're growing up that your job is to support your family, your job is to get ahead. And the second most important value for all of these men was uh, a sense of adventure, to go out there and, you know, what, conquer the world? Be whatever. the guy. Yeah, absolutely, be, the, be the, you know, the macho guy. The third was achievement. You know, as men, we're raised to believe that uh, you are 
what you, what you do, what you accomplish, what you're able to create. The fourth is the idea of pleasure. You know, going out with the guys, getting as many dates <laughs> as you can, having as much fun as you possibly can. The uh, fifth of these is to be respected, all right? And we all know, as men, what that means, you know? You're not giving me any respect, man. And then you get out there, and when you're growing up and you're a kid, and if you don't get respect, you're having fights. Here are the top priorities of our lives, you know? Be able to make money, to have a sense of adventure, to have, you know, to, to achieve, to feel pl pleasure, to be respected. That's basically the morning <laughs> of our life. This sounds like my list. What are you talking about? When was the last time you had fun? Oh, do not even listen to her. I know how to have fun. Do you mind? I'm trying to hear Wayne. Go on. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So the second part of this study, which is the after. A quantum shift has taken place. Same questions, only it's many years later, and right. they followed this over, over a lifetime. And the number one value is spirituality. Spirituality. The number one thing. It has gone from making money to spirituality, which wasn't even on the list before. You can't even find it. I've got the top 15 of them listed right here. It's not even on there. The second one is personal peace. Less anxiety, less stress, if you will. The third one is family. Now, family was on the other list, but it was way down before. Now, what happens after one of these moments, you begin to look around and say, what is it that's important to me in my life? And then the next is God's will. This is the one that says, I have a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And then honesty is the fifth quality. Not just honest that I don't steal, mm -hmm. but how honest am I as a, as a man, you know, with my feelings, with, with yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, you know. Those are the top qualities for men. So there's the before and there's the after. You can see what a significant change this is, what a, what a shift has taken place here. Hey, everybody. Hello. Thank you. We are very glad to be here tonight. Uh, Steve and Lisa are dear old friends of mine, and so when they asked me about the prospect of our band playing at their wedding, I felt like I had no choice but to say, are you sure? Are you positive that's something you want to inflict upon your friends and family at your wedding day celebration? And Steve and Lisa assured me that that was exactly what they wanted to inflict upon their friends and family at their wedding day celebration. And so, here we are. You need a bossy man to love you. <laughs> a bossy man to hold your clothes. A bossy man to dress and care for you. A bossy man to take control. You need a man with all the answers. A bossy man who run the show. A bossy man, he pays for everything. He never says, I do not know. Okay. I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> I can already tell. Yeah. What's the deal with the women? Bring it on. For women, it's even more astonishing. Before one of these quantum moments, the number one value is family. And it's not surprising because women are kind of raised in our society, in our culture, to be a good mother, to be a good daughter, to support your family, to take care of your children, and so on. The second one, which may surprise you, was a sense of, uh, of independence, of feeling as if uh, hmm. I would like to feel independent. See, women are very conflicted. Yeah, makes sense. The third was career. Now, very often, women never even felt that they had a right to go for a career because they were obligated to be taking care of their family. And this is not a put-down of that at all. What we're saying here is that there's something more. The fourth quality for women was fitting in, having to be like everybody else and so on. Yeah. And then finally, attractiveness. And this yeah. became not just like it's nice to look nice, but 
my whole values are, and how do I look, and where do I get this? You know what, that is so scary when you break it down like that, because where is it that we learn as women we're supposed to be pleasing everybody else all the time? Well, go on the newsstand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all you see are magazines with pictures of girls with waists this big, and uh, you know, with uh, implants, lots of emphasis on makeup, having the right labels, where, you know, carrying the right bags, and, and so on. So these became the top uh, qualities or characteristics or values for women before one of these shifts. Well, I hope the after list is better. Their values shift dramatically. The number one value for women after having this experience, it's right here, is my own personal growth. Now remember, before it was like taking care of everybody else, doing the right thing, fitting in, and now it's all of a sudden, how am I growing as a human being? How do I feel about myself? The second is a sense of self-esteem. Am I worth anything? How do I feel about myself? Am I a valuable human being? The third one is spirituality. My, oh, wow. my sense of my connectedness to something bigger and greater than myself. And then happiness. Hmm. Again, this wasn't even on the list. It was almost at the bottom of the list before. How often have women been raised to believe that their happiness isn't an important thing, that uh, doing what they are supposed to do rather than feeling, you know, a sense of, I'm entitled to be happy. And then a very interesting one, it's called forgiveness. This became very important in their lives. Forgiveness. That's good, because then you can forgive all those people that gave you bad information about what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, there's a whole lot of uh, resentment that begins to take place in people. It's, 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 it's what so many people just go along with. Oh, right. Joe. This is great. Hey, you're the best. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is great. We should be filming oh, this. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Good night, guys. You guys did so well in the hike today. Good night. Can I have a glass of water? Of course you can. Jason, what's this? Hmm? This paper and pencil wasn't here before. I don't know. No idea. Hey, Jason? Hmm? I think I'm gonna take a shower. Okay. I don't know, would you guys like to hear? I think maybe the only true miracle that ever happened yeah. to me in my life. A real uh, miracle? Yeah, it was, a, it was an authentic miracle for me. Uh, it was a healing that took place that I still can't explain. So it was in the year 2000, and I had taken a group of uh, 25 people on a spiritual tour to Assisi. I've made several visits there. 
In fact, I wrote an entire book called There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem based upon the prayer of St. Francis. And I lectured for a couple of hours about it, and uh, we all had visited the places uh, where St. Francis had lived and performed so many of his miracles. The next day, we were going to take a tour to a place called San Damiano, where uh, St. Clair, uh, who was the first female to ever become a part of the Franciscans, lived. And on the third floor of there was the bedroom, exactly as it was in the 13th century. There was a young man on that trip. He was 21 years old. His name was John. He was from Pennsylvania. He had uh, cerebral palsy, and he had two he very heavy braces on each one of his legs. We were going to go up to the third floor. Now, this was a winding staircase to get up to the third level where St. Clair's bedroom was. Now, John, in order to be able to go up the steps, he would have to move his leg out like this, you can imagine, and then he would go up the step, and then he'd bring the other one down, and then he'd go up the next step, and he would bring it back because his legs were stiff. But as we started to get into the very narrow part of the, uh, of, of, of the staircase, he couldn't, uh, his legs wouldn't go out. He could only go this far, so he couldn't go up. And you can imagine, he couldn't go down. It was impossible for him to go down. So there he was, he was stuck. I was ahead of him. And he stopped me and he said, Wayne, I'm in, I'm in trouble. I can't go up another step because I can't get my leg out to the side. There's no room and I can't go back down. What are we going to do? And there was a whole row of people behind waiting oh. to go up this very narrow staircase. So you have the picture? Old people don't whisper. Because old people can't hear. <laughs> we'll just talk louder and louder. So I said to him, without even thinking, John, what I want you to do is just uh, strap yourself uh, on over my back and uh, put your arms around my neck and, and just lean over and I will carry you up these steps. Now, what I haven't told you is that before we went on this trip, I had done some major damage to this right knee of mine to a point where I had it examined by s several orthopedic physicians and, and I was told that there would come a time soon when I would have to have this knee replaced because it was down to you know, bone on bone. So as he got on my back, and now we're talking about 240 pounds or so, he went, uh, uh, I went about three steps and I realized that my knee was about to collapse and I was gonna go straight down. And I had a quick vision of what the newspapers and the a CC Daily News were going to say the next morning. <laughs> Spiritual teacher collapses, bottom of the stairs, 40 people dead. You yeah, know, it was right. like... It was, and so as my knee started to go down, at that moment, I saw a vision of St. Francis. I had a vision of what he would look like, and he didn't say a word. It was very, very quick, and he just went like this with his hands. In other words, stand up. 
And suddenly, and I had the, the fragrance of roses was in there, the same fragrance that I had. Remember in the story I told moment. you? In that quantum yes. moment when I had that uh, the same kind of thing. And I stood up and I started walking up the steps with him and my knee just suddenly righted itself. It was fine. Not only did it right itself, but I suddenly had like a burst of energy like I've never had before. Wow. And I started walking faster with him on my, on my back. Then I started running and I ran up all of the stairs my wife was waiting at the top and she said what happened to you and what are you doing and everybody else is out of breath and you, I said I just I had a miracle I just don't know what happened and I realized that my knee didn't hurt anymore at all and I wasn't limping and I had no no pain in it at all by the way I've never had any surgery and anything ever done to this knee uh, it was it was a healing that had taken place in that moment you been doing? Oh. Uh -huh. I thought you were going to take a shower. I did. And your clothes? Uh, I, I was I was going to and then I, I got distracted. Huh. Well, what you been doing? Nothing. Are you all right? What do you mean? Well, you just seemed a little checked out today. Uh, just wondering if anything was wrong or... No, I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm a little worried. No. Can I look? Jason, no. Quinn, I just want to look at Jason. him. Jason. I love what you do. I just want to look. Can you please go? Quinn, I just want just to go. see... Please? No. You know, really, you're not very good anyway. Really, don't bother. Don't bother. Later on, I started to talk about this miracle, but the thing that I did was, when people would ask me, why do you think it happened to you? I would always say, well, why not? I mean, I'm Wayne Dyer, after all. <laughs> you know? And I've written an entire book about him, and he's- I deserve uh, a miracle. Yeah, and it was like, and, and I really believed that it was like a special sort of thing that came to me. That's what happens, you know, when you get your ego involved in it. And what happened in that moment is that I totally forgot my ego. It wasn't that I'm so grand and so spiritual or that I'm so special. My instantaneous reaction to what John needed was to just reach out to him, and that's when the miracle occurred. In one moment, without thinking, I reached out to a fellow human being in need and forgot about myself. And it was almost as if the door opened, the teachers found me and said, here it is. The best way to have those doors open is to forget about yourself and to reach out and serve. It's always about serving. It's, you know, one of the mistakes so many people make is they just think, well, I'm just gonna attract what I want into my life. And one of the things that I really profoundly believe in, you do not attract what you want. Mm -hmm. You attract what you are. Mm -hmm. What you are. I would have been too shy 
Everything's going to be fine. No, you didn't do anything. I, uh, I knew you felt it. I did this. I did this more than you. Listen to me. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you so much. You're going to be okay. It must have been. Found true love while staying at home. Don't stop, that was great. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. What brings you out so late? Or I should say so early. Just couldn't sleep. You having trouble with the filming? No, that's fine. Filming's easy. It's my business I can't handle. Hey, do you know chopsticks? I used to. Makes me think of being a kid when I was idealistic, back when I thought I'd make a name for myself. Oh, hey, don't say that. You have a name. More like a household name, more like Scorsese or Tarantino. Well, hang in there. Anything can happen. Why does it have to be so hard? One minute I have the, the funding to make my movie, the next I don't. Can't get the money without the talent, can't get the talent without the money. And then they pulled it all out from under me. I don't own it anymore. Seriously thinking, career change. That's a good sign. What is? You're giving up. That's good. How do you figure? You can't force these things. Right. And again with the magic thing. What's the magic? What's that? You know, I don't know why I'm telling this to the janitor or whatever you are. <laughs> I do a lot of things around him. 
Believe me. You play a damn good piano, though. You should think about doing that full time. Well, for a while I thought I would. And what happened? Well, I started playing when I was very young. I was a natural. And then I got older and I became more aware of people watching me play. And then I started to play more for them and for myself. And then I got very scared that I would disappoint them. So I did. Did what? <laughs> I disappointed everybody. I would be very clever. I'd go to a recital and I would just you know, play a couple of wrong notes on purpose as a test to see if they would still love me the same way. And basically they didn't. It was a long time before I touched a piano, which is it's crazy. When I think of how much I enjoy playing. Yeah, I was just thinking that. This would sit for years. I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't even notice it. But you're a piano player. I don't get it. You don't get that? How could you ignore what's right in front of you? Busy doing other things. You should understand that. That way, yeah. hold that thought. You hear that? I don't hear Push. anything. Listen. Listen. That's nice. I like that. I like that too. You making that up? Yeah. Well, no, um, sort of, yeah. Sort of, yeah, mostly no. <laughs> what? It's just something I could do. Make music, you mean? No. No, I can't. And you're a good faker. Yes, I'm just listening. Listening? I listen. And then I just play what I hear. I'm not making it up at all. It makes itself up. It makes itself. Exactly. I just play. <laughs> Sometimes all you gotta do is you show up, pay attention, and music happens. Your music happens. Whatever you're looking for in your life is there for you. It will show up where and when it's needed. It's always in your mind. Whatever you need to complete this project, whatever you need to create, it's all there. You can prepare and then let go. It's an easy trusting that everything will happen perfectly. I can't shoot it from here. No? No, there's this tent. Oh, but we really need something for B-roll. We don't have anything. I, I'm not the director. I don't know what David wants. Where is he anyway? He's probably sleeping off a hangover. Well, I gotta go in. I can't shoot it from out here. Oh, great. Go in. Go do that. You're not coming with me. Me? I'm not going in there. It's like <laughs> 200 degrees in there. OK. And what about you? No way, Jose. <laughs> I had better get a bump for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're my hero. <laughs> OK. You guys suck. Hey, good morning. Good morning. I got up early. I was scouting locations. What? I found the most amazing spot overlooking the ocean. For what? For this? Yeah, yeah, for this. Really? 
It's a little bit of a hike, though. That's okay. We will indulge your creativity. You sound inspired, David. I am inspired. I'm making music, doing the down. What are you talking about? What is Rob doing in there alone? That's some crazy hot yoga torture. Yeah. I can't let him be in there by himself. Cover me. I'm going in. You're going in? They got your right foot in front of you. He's going in. I can't believe it. We live in a world in which all things are possible. There are no accidents. There's this divine organizing intelligence that supports all things. I think you have to get to the place where you're no longer focused just on yourself. And the things that you really want for yourself, you begin to say, how can I want them more for someone else than I want them for me? And that's God realization. One of the things that happens when you move away from ego is that you move from a sense of entitlement to a sense of humility. You realize you're entitled to nothing. That's just the ego speaking. So the fundamental truth is that you must be like what you came from. If you came from divinity, you must be divine. If you hold your hands up and say, these are the hands of God, then what does God do with his hands? God is just giving. That's all God knows how to do. Hi. How are you this morning? <sighs> better than yesterday. That's a good way to be. Not better than anybody else, just better than you used to be. <laughs> hey, um, I was wondering, is there a place around here where I could actually uh, buy some flowers? I wanted to bring some back for my wife. I can let you have some of these if you want. Really? Yeah. I mean, they're not fancy like you get in a flower shop. They're just indigenous roses. A little more rustic. I think my wife might actually like that. Hey, no, wait, let me help you. Um, cut, cut just above the leafy part there, and above the leafy part, and try to do it on an angle. Hey, there you go. Good. Can you tell I've never done this before? Not much of a gardener. No, I usually pay people to do my gardening. People who actually know what they're doing, like you. Oh, well, I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. I've never really seen the value in flowers, I guess. Don't you ever send your wife flowers? No. Oh, that sounds bad. It's a new day. Yes, it is. You know, there are over 200 species under the genus Rosa. And there's a, a, a rose database that has, I think it was over 6,000 variations of roses. Seems almost excessive. Here. Thank you very much. Can I give you a tip? <laughs> no, nothing. You sure? It's okay. Well, I'll be sure to tell the owner of this place what a great staff he has. You just did. You? You're the owner. No, I, I really am. <laughs> oh, I apologize. I, um, you know, I thought you were just the gardener. That's an easy mistake to make. I saw you watering the plants. And Plants need to be watered. Yes, they do. Thanks again. Can I ask you a favor? Okay. I'm here for a, a, a board meeting. Yeah, I know. You were at the House of Promise, right? Yes, and I've got to give this to the executive director, but I don't know what room she's in. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I can find it. Well, actually, could you give it to her for me? Yeah, sure. Is it important? No, it's just... Um, just some papers. Okay, yeah. And if you could give it to her this afternoon, after I've left. Yeah, I can do that. Appreciate it. So you shift your thoughts from what can I get to how can I offer, how may I serve? If your attention is off yourself and about giving, the universe will respond by giving back to you. The universe will say, how may I serve you? But you have to be in a place of service yourself. 
That's when the transition is complete, when you move into that place that is without ego. Hey there. Hi. Missed you yesterday. Had a great game. Yeah. Got stuck in town. Yeah, I understand. Things come up. Yes, they do. Uh, how'd the meeting go? Nothing changed. They still need the money. But once they get the money, we'll see who gets the contract. See you in the city. All right, see you. Not so fast. Don't tilt it. Now, we don't want to crush the flowers. That's very good. Oh, I'm telling you, you don't want to know how much these flowers cost, you know? It's the same florist the mayor uses. Now, oh, be careful, please. Thank you. How about the name Rose, if it's a girl? As we move into the meaning phase of life, it, it's not as if you no longer are ambitious. It's that you have ambition with meaning. You're ambitious about other things. So now your ambition is transformed into purpose and you have to learn to become the observer and to step back. You begin to live in process, trusting where your source is taking you. You begin to detach from the outcome and that detachment allows you to no longer be fighting. It allows things to just come to you and you're no longer being the person who's making things happen. You're allowing them to show up. The fight is gone. So I get asked over and over again, is, is there a purpose to the ego? And my reaction to that is it's just, it's just not worth defending. The ego is the thing that will, is the false self. And when you're defending it, you're defending an illusion. You're defending something that really isn't who you are. Your authentic self is way beyond the ego. Every one of us knows that we came here with music to play. And yet we have a tendency to believe that we are separate entities and that uh, we have to fit in, and that's our role in life. And, and none of that is true. The shift can happen in many ways. It can be just a comet. It can be a coincidence that occurs, a particular event that uh, you weren't expecting. It can be anything at all. But the result is always the same. You begin to realize that you're not here to push life, to make it a struggle all the time. You're here to enjoy and to be living in peace. That's what happens when you're in the afternoon of your life. I was just thinking about all the things I have to do to pack us up to leave. Oh, yeah? I'm like a walking to-do list. I think 90% of my day is spent managing everyone else's life and all their problems. Uh-oh. You are very appreciated. That's not what I mean. I love taking care of you and the boys. I do. I love my family. But... But? When I paint... I go somewhere. I... I feel connected. I... I feel blessed. And you're good at it. I miss it so much. On the hike yesterday... And Jack told me that I don't paint. I realize that my own children have no idea who I am. They, they don't even know what I do. So do it. Really? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I want to stay here. What? Just for a week. Right now, just, just this next week. What, you think I'm going to leave you here all alone? Jason, every cell in my body wants to stay here just a little bit longer. Just... I'm, um, I'm hearing you, but um, I, have, I have no idea what you're saying. I need to reorient myself. I need to find my way back, and I need solitude to do it. Quinn, you're a mother of two small children. You don't, you don't, you don't get solitude. Jason, you have to know I love you. And I love the kids, and I... I am still us, but I am more than this. Okay. There's just one problem. 
See, I don't, I don't know how to do what you do. It'll be great. It's just for a week. You'll survive. And then we go back to normal. I don't know about that. Oh. Oh, oh, you're good at this. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> you know what you're going to get good at? What? Laundry. I see lots of laundry in your future. That's, that's great. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> If you want to see the doors open in your life, you detach yourself from what the ego says, and you allow yourself to live from this divine place called spirit. And what Lao Tzu called the virtues, he said there are four of them. The first of these is reverence for all of life, which is respect. The second is sincerity, which is really nothing more than just honesty. The third is gentleness, which manifests itself as kindness in our life. And the fourth is supportiveness, which just manifests itself as service, offering service to others. Those are the four virtues. And Lao Tzu asks us to live by them. There's a, there's a great quote by the poet Hafiz. He said, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Just think what a love like that can do. It lights up the whole world. doing? Yeah. So did you get everything you need? I think I got even more than that. Really? I'm actually inspired. I, I was looking at some of the footage. I'd love to do something with these interviews, something creative. Like what? Well, this place. There's something happening here. What you're talking about, the people, themes, I think I can really do something Wait with Wait a this. second. Wait a second. I thought you were just a technician on this here. Isn't that what I heard you say before? Ha, I guess not. I think I'm getting it. Well, you know, David, the point is, we're all going to get it. Ultimately, we're all going to get it. There's a great line from A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, if you want to be like me, knowing that we are alike, I will help you. If you want to be different than me, I will wait until you change your mind. And you will change your mind. And really, isn't it the ultimate thing is, why should we have to die in order to get it? We ought to be able to get it while we're here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. Nobody needs to ask the question, what is my purpose? It will always be found in service. If you can just for one day put your attention on making life better for someone else, if you can focus on thinking like that, that's how God thinks. It's an ancient concept, but it's still relevant. To touch someone's life is more valuable than any amount of money. My friend Byron Katie says, to believe that you need what you don't have is the definition of insanity. That you can't be fulfilled until you get all these things, that's an illusion. Really, you don't need anything more. It doesn't matter what it is you do. You could be a cab driver, a teacher, a factory worker, a manager. What matters is that you put your attention on how may I serve. Think of the people you go to, whoever you are in your path. You can run an entire business this way, not being attached to outcome,
putting attention on service. Your life becomes about living those virtues. How can I serve? How can I be gentle? How can I be reverent? Thinking like that means you're living in meaning. The messages of the morning are about what you can and can't do, about how society defines you. But in the afternoon, after the shift, it's about connecting to an energy that's taking care of everything, and we're all just being done. Try to stop yourself from breathing, from your fingernails growing. Living the virtues is all we need to do. The truth is, I feel something else is in charge of all of this. So it's really about surrendering to it. Surrendering to something that is bigger than you, that you are connected to, and that's really in control of everything. There's a place deep within us that wants to feel fulfilled. That wants to know that my life has made a difference. That I've left this place, this planet that I've lived on, better than when I arrived. That someone's life has been profoundly touched because of my existence. We all want that. It's not about age or about finding yourself. Wherever you are, at whatever age, you're only a thought away from changing your life. This is not a race. You don't have to run. You might even slow it down. Take a look around instead of chasing everyone. Nothing to prove. No point to make. If when it's said and done, you know in your heart that your song is sung. With your song still inside you, let it guide you every day. We all know that it's good to be humble, but don't mumble your life away. You could lose it all. You would still feel like you'd won. You might fall out of the sky, learn to fly just by reaching for the sun. No need to fret, but by regret. If when it's said and done, you know in your heart that your song is sung. With your song still inside you, let it guide you every day. We all know that it's good to be humble, but don't grumble your life away. A little teamwork. La 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 lo le lo le lo lo le lo le lo la 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 lo le lo 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 le lo 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 rubba de rubba de rubba de scrub rubba de rubba de rubba de scrub haba de haba haba do haba de haba do huba de huba de huba de ho ho Still inside you, let it guide you every day. We all know that it's good to be humble, but don't fumble, don't grumble, don't mumble. Life away.